Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you um, to Malcolm and Tall Buildings Council for the invitation um, to talk um, about the Gold Coast today. And thanks for the introduction, Malcolm. Malcolm actually gave me five minutes, and um, but I'm going to take 15 because I think I've got some sort of different perspectives about um, tall buildings, Gold Coast tall buildings in particular, that often aren't um, aren't aired. And so, just. Um, sort of going back in time a, a little bit. Um, this, um, when it first caught my eye, I was attracted instantly to this Caroline, Caroline Butler Bowden and Charles Pickett's 2000 book, Homes in the Sky, particularly as it was widely celebrated and promoted as a seminal publication on tall buildings in Australia. The front he, uh, cover hero image of the Surface Paradise skyline was promising. But the introduction raised an eyebrow with Miles Lewis from the University of Melbourne quoted as arguing that tall buildings were an alien dwelling form in Australia, introduced belatedly and not always satisfactorily. And we know that this doesn't apply to the Gold Coast. When I delved into the contents, the first mention of the Gold Coast wasn't until page 177, and the treatment lasted for only seven pages, that's 3% of a 205-page book, um, uh, and more, more, than, more than four of those seven pages were photographs. And then the three pages of text that, um, that were there presented this stereotypical view of shonky deals and dubious taste, starting with the claim that the Gold Coast is the only Australian city with no building height restrictions, with no history of building height restrictions. And as we all know, this is just not true. Um, since the first town of South Coast planning scheme in 1953, height controls were implemented through zones and buildings taller than four storeys were confined to business and shopping zones, which, you know, being Southport, Surface Paradise, Broadbeach, Burley Heads and Coolangatta. Um, as these misunderstandings illustrate, since vertical dwelling commenced in 1959 with the ten-storey Kinkaboo, the Gold Coast has not developed in the manner of a conventional city and each subsequent decade has increased its urban design complexity. Now, I've had a fascination with tall buildings since 1994, when I migrated from Melbourne to work in town planning at Gold Coast City Council. My very first development application was uh, this building, um, Oceana at Broadbeach, designed by Daryl Parker Architects. This was a set of twin 15-storey towers assessed in an afternoon with no objections, approved by delegate in one day. And this was an, a real culture shock to me, having come from a conventional city where um, in, you know, I worked for the city of Paran, um, in South Yarra um, or, you know, Windsor, a three-storey unit development might take three years um, to achieve development approval um, once you sort of go through tribunal, tribunals and objections, etc. So I bought myself a unit in the 1972 Chateau designed by the Buchan Group. Um, my unit was a matchbox, but it had a magnificent view and I really enjoyed the lifestyle attributes of being close to the beach, um, but also amid the activity of surface paradise. But the, the real thing was um, that you had this offer of a retreat to this home in the sky and I never needed to use my car. So I unequivocally subscribed to the Brisbane Development Association's motto of go tall, stop sprawl. So for over 20 years now, I've been keenly observing, considering and photographing the Gold Coast tall buildings. This is just an image, a capture of sort of some of, you know, my tall buildings album on, on Flickr. Um, along with many others, um, architectural Photographer John Golings shares this fascination and a couple of years ago he photographed every tall building on the Gold Coast from Paradise Point to Coolangatta um, and there's more than 850 tall buildings. His criteria were about being taller rather than wider. Usually, typically he went, it was sort of everything sort of five storeys and, and above. Uh, so in 1995, in preparation for a new planning scheme for the amalgamated city that took in Gold Coast and Albert Shire, with Richard Allum and others on the city's first urban heritage and character study. And on the front cover we used this quote from Steve Martin in LA Story, who marvelled ironically that some of these buildings are 20 years old. 
As you might expect, the study resulted in some unusual findings and recommendations. Um, and a central finding related to the effic efficacy of the policies of the time to manage the Gold Coast's unique identity. And this was arc articulated um, in this sort of quote up there. I won't sort of run through all of that. But essentially, we began to promote the idea that we should be looking at the Gold Coast as a model for, in the way that um, planning design happens there, um, as a model for application in other places. Specifically in relation to the Gold Coast, tall buildings, um, through analysis and discussion with local architects and engineers, we arrived at three key understandings. Firstly, we acknowledge that architecturally, while few of the Gold Coast tall buildings are significant in their own right, their significance is collective for these clusters that they create and define the urban structure. Having said this, I do have a few favourite individuals which I think are significant. The sands, um, everyone loves the sands and the penthouses for their fine um, geometries and proportions. Um, Deville at Main Beach, if you know it, has this amazing Hawaiian tiki pop decoration. Um, and Brian, Toy uh, Brian Toyota's uh, Grand Mariner um, for its pink and mauve colour scheme that just blends into the sky um, at dusk around this, this time of year. And there's a, a, a suite of buildings that are all named Maras. Um, I think they're by McMaster's. Um, and I also like Barry Lee's wave at Broadbeach, which you know, most people would be familiar with. Um, the real significance of Gold Coast tall buildings is their clustering in the landscape for the urban form and the imagery that they create. Architectural historian Philip Goad, who was part of that uh, Urban Heritage and Character Study team, commented aptly that these are not New York's cathedrals of commerce, but Queensland's cathedrals of tourism. Um, the urban phenomenon is um, commonly misperceived as this massive spine or high rise or, or strip of high rise development stretching the full 40 kilometres of the, of the beach. But in reality, to date, tall buildings have been confined to those activity hubs. Um, small clusters at Runaway Bay, Southport, Main Beach, Surface Paradise, Broad Beach. There's a few at Burley Heads, uh, Palm Beach, and then there, there aren't really any tall buildings until you get to Coolangatta. The second, oops. so these, you know, these sort of images which show that sort of the postcard view, it's that, that's the icon of the Gold Coast, um, is the clustering of the tall buildings in the urban form. Um, you know, this whole sort of idea has, uh, um, you know, has um, sort of, you know, come through and been played with in, in all sorts of ways. Um, I'll just leave you with that. Um, the second um, real difference about Gold Coast tall buildings is that they're tall buildings on holidays. Um, and you know, that, that's what really sets them apart from buildings, tall buildings in business districts and social housing uh, precincts of other Australian cities. It's what Philip Goad implies in his nickname for Surface Paradise is Miami Manhattan. Um, these are resort style tall buildings on, on holidays, slender forms with balconies in landscape grounds with tropical planting and, and swimming pools a form following function, but also assured by the planning scheme with mandatory provisions um, such as, the, it used to be, 40% maximum site coverage, 10% deep planting, um, un underground car parks with podiums not to exceed one metre above ground, natural ground level. Last night I did have a glance at the high-rise provisions in the current draft city plan and they bear little resemblance to those earlier planning schemes and are more like provisions in capital city CBDs. And this, uh, I guess, you know, is, um, you know, and I understand the intent is to densify development and optimise activity at street level along the light rail transit um, corridor. Um, but I do wonder what the outcomes will result in um, for the urban character and, and, and amenity. The third um, difference is just simply the variety in the styles and forms um, of tall buildings at the Gold Coast. Um, in the 1990s, when I was working in town planning, um, after Japanese divestment, Gold Coast City uh, Council was courting Middle Eastern tourism. And I recall meeting with a delegation of officials from Dubai who recognised this variety, and they wanted to understand how we achieved it. And they were, they were perplexed by how every development um, of theirs would routinely max out the 
uh, the building envelope allowance, and they all ended up looking the same. Um, and the lesson um, in this was that we were actually doing something right. The 16 provisions of those multi-unit and resort residential codes, including setback site coverage, shadow, height, density, plot ratio, etc., they generate so many permutations that no two buildings uh, emerged organically as the same. Um, of, of course, some designers and developers have introduced um, sort of trademark styles um, and finishes, like you know, Raptus buildings have uh, you know, typically been white with Mediterranean ornament. And typically you can recognise a Meriton building or a McMaster's building. But amongst these, few are identical, unless of course they're deliberate twins like the Oceana um, uh, you know, buildings that I, that I mentioned before. So some of you might remember the Living High Architectural Guide and Heritage Walks in 1997. Um, these attracted national interest and you know, publicity. Um, this initiative documented the evolution of tall building design, which reflected changes in technology and ethos and fashion over time. At that point in 97, Belle Maison and Grand Mariner and Moroccan were the most recent examples and uh, Hudson Conway's Crown Towers and Sunland's uh, Sun City were still under construction. And these buildings were all below 50 storeys. Um, but that was almost 20 years ago. And um, a lot of built, tall building activities happened since. And we now have the giants like Q1 and Seoul at 78 and 77 storeys um, that, you know, that actually are skyscrapers. They pierce the sky and they dramatise the, the skyline. And now we know we have, have sort of proposals for, you know, up to 100 stories have been talked to a, a, about. Um, this one, you know, before on, um, on the former Aluka um, site. Interesting thing about this one to me is actually what's going below ground. 12 stories of basement car parking. That's, you know, that's sort of breathtaking when you sort of think of that. And, um, and uh, Sunland's um, proposal for the spit. So, um, from 2000, um, I strayed from town planning at the Gold Coast and worked primarily um, uh, for, um, on development projects for Arts Queensland Heritage Trials Network and then the State Library here in Brisbane. These year, 10 years or more, maybe it was a dozen, years later these roles in turn propelled me back to the Gold Coast um, in this different role to conceptualise and develop the brief and run the, the competition for the Gold Coast Cultural Precinct. Um, as you can imagine, I for one wasn't surprised when the competition threw up a vertical solution um, for the art museum. So while I can't speak um, so authoritatively on this most recent cohort of tall buildings um, at the Gold Coast, I can confidently say that on the whole, the Gold Coast does tall buildings really well, it has done. Um, and despite attracting national criticism and being overlooked as a city worthy of consideration, um, for, for this um, important facet of its identity. I'm also delighted that in the decade that I was away from the Gold Coast, architecture schools have established at uh, Griffith and Bond universities, all credit to Professor Holden and also Philip Follant at um, Bond. Um, and these schools, just last year, have graduated master's students. So they're serious courses. It's, and um, this is a really encouraging sign for our maturing uh, urbanisation, maturing, um, and I guess, design legitimacy of, of, of the Gold Coast as a, as a city that, that is quite serious. Um, and hopefully it will yield a new breed of local designers who'll be sensitive to maintaining this distinctiveness um, about the Gold Coast. But um, now back to the cultural <coughs> precinct projects. Art museums um, are conventionally low, wide building forms. Um, and there are few precedents for vertical art museums. And perhaps the most relevant um, is what I've shown here on the left, is the new New Museum in New York. This is, while only seven storeys, it sits in a streetscape with sim similar scale buildings and it's actually, it's a private institution, it's primarily about presenting art through exhibitions, contemporary art through exhibitions, um, and it's not really as uh, uh, sort of multifunctional as the sort of civic art tower that is proposed at the Cultural Precinct. Then there's the Mori, often sort of referred to, the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, but essentially that's just 
a conventional myopic art gallery um, with an observation deck and a cafe at the top of a tall building. Um, and it's really much like our, you know, Q1, which incidentally, you know, I have often thought would be a fabulous place for an urban design and, you know, museum and library to sort of like have that up there, you know, looking out over the city. Um, there have also been structures like Anish Kapoor's orbital sculpture and observation tower for the London Olympics. But again, you know, it's really hard to find other comparable um, you know, sort of typologies for what, um, what ARM are proposing for the cultural precinct. Nothing really compares. It's a new typology and it promises to be really special. Um, I often quote Matthew Condon's um, passage in the novel An Eye at the Pink Poodle, um, which um, says, you know, that's what I liked about the Gold Coast, um, the blossoming, blossoming of all these different fantasies, how they all merged together, got mixed up and became strange new hybrids. That's the thing. It's about strange new hybrids. Um, and this is one of my favourite paintings um, by Gold Coast artist Scott Redford, who says, our goal must be nothing less than, estab than the establishment of surface paradise on Earth. So what I love about ARM's design concept is that it picks up on the Gold Coast. Uh, it, you know, it picks up that the Gold Coast is unfettered by these stylistic traditions and it enjoys a sense of freedom to pursue hedonism and fantasy. The design cleverly shows that they understand this and even you know, the incorporation of a bungee jump is not out of place here. Um, it caused a few comments, but you know, um, if, if you sort of propose that in Adelaide or Melbourne, um, it, people would think it was absurd, not so at the Gold Coast. Now, the bungee. <laughs> um, so the competition, um, we put out a call, a global call for expressions of interest. Um, we had 75 entries and then three teams were selected and commissioned to develop their concepts. Um, first was, oh, did I miss one? Um, yeah, uh, Nick and Sakai from, oh, actually, I think my pictures are back to front. Um, Crab Studio, um, who designed the beautiful Abedian School of Architecture at Bond University, teamed up with local luminaries DBI. And then we had Nick and Sakai from Japan, giant architectural, or, you know, sort of multi-design um, firm from, from Japan. And... ARM. Um, interestingly, of the 75 stage one submissions, only two proposed tall buildings. One of them was this one by Yoshida Finlay and Cox Rayner, and the other was um, Wilson's and Timothy Hill. And I can say that these were in the jury's final dozen but they didn't actually get shortlisted you know, amongst the three for, to, to, to go on to stage two. It's more interesting, too, that ARM's stage one submission actually didn't include a tall building. And that emerged through the concept development in stage two. Um, and when we quizzed Howard and Jesse Judd about this evolution, um, they said, Oh, it just became apparent that we needed to ask ourselves, you know, what happens in the vertical direction? And we thought, well, what about a multi-storey multi art, art tower? So truly, ARM's concept um, responded almost perfectly to the brief. It cleverly resolved site planning issues and it surprised and delighted every juror. And the jury's selection, as, as Malcolm um, mentioned, was unanimous. Um, Professor Michael Sorkin, um, said, you know, it takes in the whole site, it's incredibly energetic, it's complex, it embraces activities from skateboarding to basketball to playing opera and theatre, um, to a wonderful vertical art gallery. It's a gift to the Gold Coast. And this sentiment was echoed when the winner was revealed to the community. There were, a, of course, as you'd expect, a handful of negative comments, but overwhelmingly the response was positive. Um, and in my 25 years in urban planning, design and development, I've never experienced uh, such wholesale uh, enthusiasm for a public project design. Um, there's a great um, video documentary um, that we sort of commissioned through that. It's um, compared by Li Lin Chin from SBS 
Um, it's about the competition, um, and you can view that. It's still, you know, on on the website. Um, and um, in fact, even if you put your QR scanner up there now, you could go straight to it. But it's really quite simple. Just Gold Coast Cultural Precinct info. Um, just a quick mention about um, the, the, the vision and the design brief. Um, these are also on the website for you know, anyone to sort of look at, download, copy. Um, in writing the brief, oh, and essentially the vision was about how do we create a, a cultural centre of gravity, a new distinctly Gold Coast, distinctly 21st century platform to express ourselves and our pride in the city. Um, strategies. Um, Essentially, there were programming strategies, there, there were design strategies. And in writing the brief, um, I tried to strike a balance between prescribing the expected outcomes while allowing for creative design responses. Um, and there were lots of um, uh, you know, requests for clarification about sort of you know, process and logic matters, but not a single request um, regarding design intent and objectives. Um, without sort of wanting to blow our own trumpet, um, I'd suggest that it's a good template to follow. We received this complimentary message um, from an architectural um, competition advisor in the US saying that our brief was one of the best that he'd ever seen. So the design competition was hugely enhanced by the inclusion of a competition advisor and we also had a probity advisor. Um, we were fortunate to engage Andrew McKenzie who was marvellous and um, he just brought this sort of good sense confidence particularly around probity and fairness um, preserving both confidentiality and, and transparency. Um, and since the competition, I've been working on uh, uh, you know, other projects. In fact, I left council yesterday to, because uh, I'm about to sort of take up a um, PhD research project with Bond University. Um, and that coincidentally includes um, a study with um, a, a sort of project that I'm doing with John Gollings um, about tall stories, tall buildings and tall stories. So Malcolm's giving me the wind up. So just the final little part that I want to say is just simply the merits of a, a vertical art, art museum. Um, firstly, of course, it introduces spectacle views to the tower as a beacon from afar and as a destination from within the, um, the, the wider urban landscape. Um, this is one of the other projects I've been working on is how do we pull together the portfolio of projects that stitch up and, um, and, uh, and, and create this activity passage between the cultural precinct and surface paradise. And um, a whole, uh, you know, the other things that it sort of promises is, you know, sort of not just views to it, but views, views, yeah, <laughs> views um, from it. Um, so Howard's going to talk, um, you know, talk um, sort of more about the actual sort of details of this this project. Um, but essentially, um, it's you know there are incredible merits of of um, a ver vertical art. Um, museum and perhaps these should come out in sort of discussion. I haven't had a chance to talk with Howard about this so I hope he, he agrees um, that this is a, a sort of a, a ambitious undertaking for our city um, and we hope that in time that you know the full vision will materialise.